Dear all, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation about freeze drying basics by Bushi. My name is Marco Muri and I'm the business area manager for formulation. So that means my team and me are in the headquarter in Switzerland and we're responsible for freeze drying, spray drying and encapsulation. In today's presentation, I would like to give you some insights about the basics of freeze drying. So we'll talk about different parameters, what's important in freeze drying and how to choose the different kinds of parameters and so on. But before we go into actual freeze drying, we will need to look at the physical foundation of sublimation. Water can be available in, in three different forms. It can be available as a solid, as ice. It can be available as liquid, or it can be available in gas form as vapor. Within freeze drying, we are using the effect of sublimation. That means that we turn solid ice directly into water vapor without moving over the liquid phase. But now how does this work? If we look at the phase diagram of water on the right hand side, we can see that water with lower temperatures and various kinds of pressures is available as a solid. At higher temperatures and also a bit higher pressures, water will be available as a liquid. And at even higher temperatures, lower pressures, water will be available as a gas in vapor form. Now, what we want to do in freeze drying is so-called sublimation. So we move directly from ice to vapor without going over the liquid phase. The opposite process would be called deposition, which is important in the condenser of a freeze dry. So that we can achieve a sample to sublimate, the conditions need to be below the triple point of water. You can see the triple point in red in the diagram. This is the point or the parameter set where water is available as ice, liquid and gas at the same time. The conditions are for water zero degrees or 6.11 millibars of pressure. So important is that during freeze drying, we keep temperature and pressure below the triple point. So below zero degrees and below 6.11 millibar and then sublimation will happen. Another important thing that we need to consider and that is often misunderstood in freeze drying, yes, freeze drying is working at very low temperatures, but still freeze drying consumes quite a lot of energy to sublimate the ice into vapor. So for one gram of ice, we need 2,800 joules of energy, which is a lot. It's about six times more than for simple evaporation from liquid into gas form. And this energy needs to be supplied to the process, but we will talk about this on a further slide in how to deliver this quite high amount of energy for the sublimation to happen. When we look at the parameters of freeze drying, the most important parameter is definitely the pressure. And the pressure in the system, in freeze drying we're using low pressures. And what's important, the pressure will define or control the sample temperature during freeze drying. Now, if you look at the table on this slide, this is for purely aqueous systems. So in purely aqueous systems, if we choose a pressure of 6.11 millibar, which is the triple point of water, the temperature of the sample after a certain time will be zero degrees. Now, in our days, freeze drying, we're not using pure water to be freeze dried. We're using aqueous systems with some solids inside, some APIs, some excipients, 
um, some cryo protections and so on. This is reducing the melting point of this mixture. And this is why we are typically working at lower pressures than 6.11 millibar. In typical freeze drying, we're working with pressures of one millibar and below. A pressure of one millibar would equal a temperature of about minus 20 degrees. Now, um, if we go even lower in pressure, the sample temperature will drop to an even lower level. The minimum pressure we can achieve in a freeze dryer is about 0 0.03 millibars of pressure. And this would equal a temperature of about minus 50 to minus 60 degrees. So the pressure is very important and typically used in the range of one millibar down to 0 0.03 millibars, depending on the sample temperature we would like to achieve. Now, the sample temperature is important because the driving force of sublimation is the temperature difference between the condenser, so the actual freeze dryer, and the sample temperature. The sample in the freeze dryer in the L200 on the right and in the L300 on the left is sitting on top of the freeze dryer, either in a chamber or attached as a manifold. Now, depending on the pressure we choose here, as an example, 0 0.7 millibar, we achieve a sample temperature, in this case, minus 24 degrees. Now, that the vapor that is formed on top is moving down to the condenser and is collected, we need a temperature difference between the sample and the condenser temperature. This will then create a suction and the vapor will be moving downwards to be condensated again. In the L200, we have a condenser temperature of minus 55 degrees. That's the machine on the right. And in the L300, we have a condenser temperature of minus 105 degrees, so the machine on the left. What we need to achieve proper freeze drying is a difference between those two temperatures of 15 to 20 degrees. This will allow us to freeze dry properly. In principle, we can say that the bigger the difference is, the faster the freeze drying process will be, but there are other effects that are important. So now we need to make sure that our sample is not too cold. In the example we see here, in the L200, we would have a difference of about 30 degrees, and in the L300, we would have even a bigger difference of about 80 degrees. That's perfect conditions for freeze drying. Now, a often and very common misunderstanding in freeze drying is, if we go back to this table, that the lower the pressure is, the faster the freeze drying process will be. And this is not correct because the lower we set the pressure, the lower will be the sample temperature. So we can go down to minus 50, minus 60 degrees. If we would do that, we will reduce this temperature difference and the process will be much slower than if we would have a bigger temperature difference. So that's why we choose the pressure in a level where the sample remains frozen, but does not be as cold that the process will be slowed down. So that's why we choose typical temp uh, pressures between one millibar down to about 0 0.1 millibar, depending on the melting point of the sample. As I already mentioned on a previous slide, um, sublimation is consuming quite a lot of energy. So we need for one gram of ice to be sublimated, we need 2,800 joules of energy. That is a lot. Now, there are two different ways how we present the sample in a freeze dry. First, on the left side in the picture, is the shelf freeze drying. In this case here, we use a while, but we can also use trays to present the sample to a freeze dryer. 
Now, the shelves that are used can be either heated or unheated. In a heated shelf, we can use conduction, convection, and radiation as an energy source. The conduction will happen directly from uh, the heatable shelf of the freeze dryer, whilst the radiation will be energy that is sent from the top shelf, which is heated as well, downwards, and then we will have the convection from the outside to heat up the sample. Now, this allows us to deliver sufficient energy to the system so that it dries much faster. In the literature, we can see if we heat up the sample by just one degree, the freeze drying time will be shortened by 13%. So this means by only an increase of five degrees, we will shorten the freeze drying time by half. So here in this case, we have a heatable shelf where we can deliver energy to the system. There are also systems available without heatable shelves. In this case, the process will just take much longer to be dried because the energy that is available will be only delivered by convection, so energy from the outside. Now, if we look on the right-hand side of the picture, we can see a manifold attached to a valve, which is attached to a freeze dryer. This is another way how we present samples. In this case, we will have the environmental conditions that are heating up our samples and that are delivering the energy to the system. What we do in this case is we are freezing the sample in a way that it is covering the sample vessel from the inside and using up as much surface as possible with a rather thin layer. This will help us to, again, speed up the process of freeze dry. Now, with manifold conditions, you will have the environmental energy supplied to heat up your sample, so you can see differences. If your lab is not completely air conditioned and always at the same temperature level, you will see faster freeze drying on a beautiful and warm day compared to a cold day. Now, freezing of the sample is very important. In principally, there are two kinds of samples, as you can see in the two graphs below. There's a crystalline sample and there are amorphous samples. They're different, but not that different. Now, what often is misunderstood in freeze drying is that people think once a sample has reached the freezing point, now on the left-hand side, we have water and salt, that it is completely frozen. And this is not correct. So what is happening is the sample is cooling down. It reaches zero degrees, but it is not yet frozen. It goes into a level which we call supercooling, so it, free, it cools below the freezing point. Crystals are formed, and once those ice crystals are formed, the entire sample will crystallize and freeze through, and we will achieve frozen state at zero degrees of the sample. But now, at the freezing point, the sample is not completely frozen. We still have a portion of solution and a portion of ice. To achieve complete solidification of the sample, we will need to achieve a temperature that is below the freezing temperature, the so-called eutectic temperature or collapse temperature. This temperature on the left-hand side is about minus 20 degrees. After that, the sample is completely frozen and everything is in solid form. Now, what does this mean to, for you? First, you cannot use a household freezer to freeze samples in freeze drying. A typical household freezer goes to about minus 20 degrees. And this will not be enough to get your samples sufficiently frozen. If you attach a sample that is not completely frozen, you will have some liquid in there which is starting to boil and that might change the structure 
of your sample during freeze drying. So typically we recommend freezing in minus 40 or minus 80 freezers or then using dry ice with an ethanol bath or liquid nitrogen to freeze the samples. Same thing for the amorphous sample. We have a freezing temperature, but then we only have a soil and rubbery state that we achieve. And to achieve the glassy state, we need to go below the glass transition temperature or collapse temperature, which is typically even lower than the eutectic temperature of crystalline samples. That means amorphous samples typically need to be freeze dried at lower temperatures or lower pressures than crystalline samples. Now, afterwards, and we spoke about heating the samples before, in the process, we will also need to make sure that even though we supply heat to the system, that our samples will not go above the eutectic temperature or the glass transition temperature again. So we will need to design the process in a way that the sample temperature remains below those critical temperatures. What is happening otherwise? If we should go above the critical temperature during the freeze drying process, we can see a so-called collapse in the sample. Collapse is actually very simple to explain. You have your sample, which is a solid. It is surrounded by ice in the freeze dryer. The ice is turning into gas and is moving out of the sample. Now you go over the collapse temperature. Parts of your sample start to melt some of the solvents become liquid again and start to redissolve your sample. And then instead of a fluffy cake, you will end up with some very spongy, hard material. Depending on what your plan is with your sample, this can be a problem. If you use a pharmaceutical and you use freeze drying as your last step, basically as your production step, then this is absolutely not acceptable and you must avoid collapse at all costs. If you're just using freeze drying to dry your material as an intermediate process of synthesis or in biotechnology, then you don't necessarily need to worry about collapse too much. Um, to avoid collapse in, in cases where, where it really matters, the Bushi system has a, a system implemented that will let you know once you get in the area where collapse might happen, and you can even allow the machine to abort the process if the sample temperature should get in an area where a collapse could happen to, to protect your sample and to make sure it does not get destroyed during the process. That you can observe the sample temperature and, and collapse conditions and so on, sample measure, uh, temperature measurement is very important. If we again look at the freeze drying while, what you can see is you have the frozen sample on the bottom. You have the sublimation front depending on the length on your process somewhere in between and you have a dried cake of samples or so already dried sample on top. Now you always want to know what the temperature of your sample is that is not yet dried. So when you place a sample temperature sensor in your freeze dryer, you always want to place it on the very bottom in the center of the while and you freeze it together with the sample to make sure you know the temperature of that part of your sample that will freeze dry the very last. And like this, you can perfectly observe and control your sample temperature with the pressure, with the heatable shelves and so on during the entire process. Now I would like to thank you for your attention. Of course, there's a lot more to know about freeze drying, um, but the most important thing is 
the pressure is the most important parameter. It will control your sample temperature. Energy needs to be supplied to the process. It can either happen from the environment or by active heating via heatable shelves, but the critical temperatures need to be observed and the sample needs to be below the critical temperature to not see a collapse happening. Further, also freezing of the sample needs to happen at low temperature so that we see a complete freezing and that we stay below the eutectic or the collapse temperature of the sample. Again, now I thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all success for your freeze drying activities. If you should be interested in a Bushi freeze dryer, please don't hesitate to contact our organization. We will be very happy to help you with your applications and to support you in the process of choosing the right freeze dryer for your needs. Now, thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye.